Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr and I'm coordinator for the Coastal Marine Ecosystem Based Management Tools Network. Uh, we are very, very excited today to have Don Wright from Esri, who well, many of you know. Um, Speaking today about ecological map marine units, um, a 3D mapping of the ocean based on NOAA's World Ocean Atlas. And we're, we're really glad Dawn could take time out of her incredibly busy schedule to be with us today. Um, and to let you know, this webinar is hosted, it's co-hosted by the EBM Tools Network, uh, which is co-coordinated by NatureServe and OpenChannels.org. Um, and it's and I also have Nick Weiner uh, as co-moderator. Uh, he is here representing OpenChannels.org. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to let you guys know one thing, um, and that's how to ask questions. There's a question panel in the user interface. Um, if you just type your questions in there, I can relay them to Dawn during the question and answer portion of the webinar. Uh, we should have a, a good amount of time at the end for to, for answering questions. Um, if you have sort of quick clarifying questions during the webinar. I might be able to ask Don during the webinar. Otherwise, we'll hold questions to the end. But you can go ahead and send in your questions at any point so you don't forget them. Uh, you can just go ahead and send them in. We'll have them on hand. Okay. Don, we'll turn it over to you now. Thank you so much for being here. Okay. Thank you very much, Sarah. I'm just doing a check to see that the my audio is coming through all right. Yeah, you sound great. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Yeah. So uh, welcome, everyone, and happy Wednesday halfway through another week, and it's my pleasure to uh, share with you details of uh, this very exciting project, which is uh, really in its infancy. We've been working on this for a couple of years now and just had it published, and now we're uh, uh, seeking uh, collaborators and uh, hope that you will enjoy this and that you will want to work with us to further this project, to improve it, and to use it in your own work, uh, particularly for marine spatial planning. Uh, I'm giving this presentation on behalf of myself and the other two co-leads on this project. So uh, I'm Dawn Wright, the Chief Scientist of ESRI, or the Environmental Systems Research Institute. I'm also still on the faculty at Oregon State University. Uh, the other co-leads on the project are Roger Sayer, who is a USGS Senior Scientist for Ecosystems, Climate, and Land Use Change, and he is really the impetus uh, for this project. And my colleague at Esri, Sean Breyer, who is the technical lead on the project and also Esri's uh, ArcGIS content program manager. What we're talking about here is, oh, I'm trying to advance my slides and nothing is happening. Some, Don, sometimes it gets stuck and then if you uh, back out and then and start the pre uh, showing the presentation in presentation mode again, it'll sort of unstick. Okay. Oh, I don't want to leave the, leave the webinar. <laughs> okay. No, no, don't leave the webinar. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that, yeah. That's that's the kind of back out that, backing out that right. I didn't want. <laughs> yes. Okay. okay so, so very quickly, uh, this project is actually a project that was commissioned uh, by the Group on Earth Observations. And for those of you who aren't familiar with uh, GEO, this is a, a mini United Nations of sorts uh, consisting of about 100 nations who are collaborating to build what's known as GEOS, the Global Earth Observation System of Systems, uh, in several societal benefit areas, uh, one of which is uh, climate. Uh, uh, other areas are weather, water. Uh, these are the areas that uh, the ecosystem uh, mapping falls into. And what they have asked uh, of, mainly of Roger Sayer, who is the USGS task lead, uh, for global ecosystem classification and mapping. Uh, they asked of him to develop a standardized, robust, and practical global ecosystems classification and map for the entire planet's terrestrial, freshwater, and marine ecosystems. Uh, Roger turned uh, to us at ESRI uh, to help him with this, and it's been a real pleasure to work with him. And as such, now, uh, we, we have been working on ecological land units. Uh, I'm talking to you today about ecological marine units. There's actually an ecological coastal units project that will follow on immediately from this. And then there will ultimately be ecological freshwater units. And these are under uh, the rubric of GEO's Biodiversity Observation Network. 
And the Ecological Marine Units Project is now under the new uh, GEO Glo Global Ecosystems Initiative, or GECO, and that came out of uh, GEO's 2016 transitional work plan. So uh, this uh, global ecosystems uh, initiative uh, has four pieces that are related to it, uh, a European Horizon 2020 Eco Potential Project, uh, a Horizon 2020 uh, Satellite-Based Wetlands Observation uh, Project, and then the global EMUs I'm going to talk to you about today and the global EFU. So that, that's the context uh, for this work. And just to give you an idea of what was accomplished for the terrestrial piece of this, you can go to uh, the several websites uh, that are listed on the right-hand side of the screen to get the background on the global ecological land units. And basically what we did uh, for, for that particular effort was to produce uh, what we hope is a, uh, an ecosystem um, geo-accounting system based on four major global authoritative layers for the Earth, bioclimate, landform, lithology, and land cover, all at a 250 meter re uh, resolution so that throughout the world we can describe just about any place on the planet according to those four parameters. So the example that you see here is that for a chosen spot on a planet, uh, that particular place may be warm, wet plains on metamorphic rock with mostly deciduous forest. And you can see that that classification name is derived from the four uh, layers that went into that, uh, went into describing that place, the bioclimate, the landform, the lithology, and uh, the land cover. And the idea here is to produce a standard repeatable accounting framework, uh, a global view of environmental diversity, uh, particularly for uh, assess assessing ecosystem goods and services. So I'm going into uh, to all of this because we used a very similar approach for ecological uh, marine units. And with the ecological marine units, uh, we've had a lot of interest in this in terms of who would want such a global uh, accounting framework for, for the oceans in terms of environmental diversity. So on the left, you see the many organizations who have expressed uh, interest in this project aside from GEO and GEOS, uh, according to their, their commissioning of this work, but their groups like the IUCN, uh, Sylvia Earle's Mission Blue Alliance is going to be adopting Ecological Marine Units framework for uh, their Hope Spot uh, network and for their new system that they're developing for uh, people and organizations to design and propose new Hope Spots. Uh, there's the FAO and the ICES, for instance, as well, and many, many other groups that are listed on the left and on the right. Again, the reason for doing this uh, is mainly to assist with assessing uh, ecosystem health, resilience, uh, ecosystem services valuation, if that's possible, uh, in the oceans. And many of you who are out there in the network are doing some really valuable and important work along those lines. Uh, various types of conservation planning, again, particularly for marine protected area uh, design, uh, all, all kinds of, of different uh, uses. And it will be very it is very interesting to us to see how people are coming forward as we describe this project to them and as they get involved with us, how they intend uh, to use the ecological marine units. Now, there are all kinds of other ways to to carve up and to classify and to understand uh, the ocean. So uh, we're, we're all familiar with these many regionalizations of the ocean, such as the LMEs or the large marine ecosystems, the biogeographic realms, uh, the Miao marine ecoregions of the world, uh, the goods classification, global open ocean and deep sea, the Longhurst pelagic ecosystems and so forth. What we are proposing here and what we're working on is not something that will uh, set aside or supersede these very important regionalizations of the oceans, 
but we're trying to get uh, a bit deeper, if you'll pardon the pun, in terms of uh, a system, a classification that covers all of the oceans, not just the surface, something that is, is truly 3D, something that is uh, quantifiable, a quantifiable definition uh, that goes beyond just reflections of researchers' perceptions and, and their local experiences. So uh, I hope that you'll, you'll see uh, that this is something that can be useful along those lines. And we looked for a data set uh, that we could use as a very important authoritative first step in describing the physical setting of the ocean, which will in turn drive its ecological uh, character, which will in turn help us to understand uh, the ecosystem responses uh, and, and ecosystem, the true uh, ecological units uh, in the ocean. So we turn to our friends at NOAA and uh, NOAA's World Ocean Atlas, and we found this to be uh, the best global uh, data set uh, for, uh, for our project. Uh, many of you hopefully are familiar with the World Ocean Atlas. We used uh, the 2013 version 2, and on the screen you see the full citation for this extremely important data set. Uh, there are actually four separate citations for the World Ocean Atlas. There's not enough room on the screen to put all those citations, but what you're looking at is the citation for uh, temperature. Uh, as you may know, the World Ocean Atlas uh, divides the world's oceans into uh, quarter degree by quarter degree uh, grid cells. Uh, particularly for temperature, uh, salinity, dissolved oxygen. Uh, the nutrients are actually uh, uh, sampled or available at a one kilometer uh, resolution. So this is a quarter degree uh, horizontally uh, and for the most part vertically, but there are 102 depth zones ranging in thickness uh, in the World Ocean Atlas from five meters at the surface to 100 meters uh, uh, in the deep ocean. And there's a slight error on this slide here. It should be 100 meters even at the very, very bottom. Uh, there's also apparent oxygen utilization and, and percent oxygen saturation that's in this very important uh, data set. But we chose to, to focus um, mainly on temperature, salinity, dissolved oxygen, nitrate, uh, silicate, and phosphate. So what we did, and this is a very uh, busy slide, but I'm going to go through it step by step uh, with you so that you can hopefully understand our approach. We decided to take the over 52 million points, uh, point observations that are in the uh, World Ocean Atlas and to build a point mesh. Uh, this is a 3D framework uh, in which we extracted the World Ocean Atlas data into a global point mesh framework uh, that we created uh, from those 52 million plus points. Each point with at least uh, the six world ocean uh, atlas uh, attributes. So if you, if you look on the left hand side uh, of the slide, that's a, a cartoon that shows uh, again the world ocean atlas uh, structure. Uh, we attributed uh, each of those mesh points with the six World Ocean Atlas uh, physical and chemical parameters, and in addition to that, uh, our X, Y, and Z coordinates, uh, so that we have uh, these volumetric regions that you're looking at in the middle of the screen. Uh, next was a very important step where uh, it's very hard to deal with these 52 million uh, observations, particularly to query them. So we used statistical clustering. So, uh, and this was in mainly four major steps. We used uh, k-means statistical clustering so that we could identify from those 52 million points some physically distinct, relatively homogeneous volumetric regions in the water column. Uh, and so the, these are regions that kind of self-formed and self-selected from the data. Then we used backward stepwise discriminant analysis to make sure that all six of the major variables, the temperature, salinity, oxygen, and nutrients, the three nutrients, were contributing significantly to the clustering. Next, we used pseudo-F statistical uh, analysis, a, a pseudo-F statistic 
to give us an optimum number of clusters for the world ocean. So this clustering gave us 37 units as an optimum uh, throughout all the world's oceans. And then finally, we used canonical discriminant analysis to verify that all 37 of the clusters were significantly different from one another, and they were. So that uh, gave us our, our clusters uh, on the right-hand side of the screen, essentially the ecological marine units. And then we, we tacked on some important layers to the very top and to the very bottom uh, of, of the ocean, so to speak. We have MODIS uh, ocean color uh, to give us a, a sea surface, uh, a seascape. Uh, thanks to the work of Maria Cavanaugh and her colleagues at Woods Hole. And at the bottom, we have a geomorphology base, uh, the Global Geomorphology Classification of Peter Harris and his colleagues uh, at Grid Arendal in Norway. So uh, these are our ecological marine units. Uh, I'll share with you how to actually access the paper, the data, and uh, this uh, summary dictionary that I'm showing you, just one page, one page out of the, the uh, over 100 pages in that uh, document. This is giving you a summary, one of the largest uh, EMUs uh, in our collection, EMU uh, 13, which covers about 25 percent of the world's oceans. In the map that you see, the differences in the colors are not differences in depth per se, they're, they're differences in the thickness of this volumetric unit. And each of these units is named according to a technical name that aligns with uh, CMEX classification and a common name. So if you recall when I was talking about the ecological land units, each ecological land unit had a name in four parts according to those four major data layers that went into determining that classification. Similarly with the EMU, each EMU has a technical name that is in six parts according to uh, the uh, the temperature, the uh, the salinity, uh, the oxygen content, and the nutrients. Actually, it's uh, in seven parts because, of course, the depth is there as well. So this is a unit that is deep. Uh, it's very cold. It's euhaline, hypoxic, and it's got the uh, high nitrate, medium phosphate, high silicate. That's a technical name. There's also a common name so that even a sixth grader should be under, able to understand uh, these units. And so for this particular uh, EMU, uh, we also provide the vertical profile, the global vertical profile uh, for uh, this unit so that you can see the averages in those uh, six parameters. Now there are ways that you can explore uh, each of these ecological marine units, if you'd like, you can also just explore any of the 52 million points. Uh, this is a free web app in which you can click on any point. And so here uh, the user has clicked on a point in the Central Atlantic Ocean. On the side it gives you the vertical profile, uh, in this case of dissolved oxygen, but you can get a vertical profile for any of the six parameters. And it shows you the ecological marine units that are in or underneath this point on the surface. So there's an EMU, a shallow one that's in pink, all the way down to uh, the deep EMU below it that's in blue, and you can get all of the statistics, the summary statistics for that, uh, from that particular point in the ocean drilling down. So this is a web app that's available. Uh, there's also the similar a uh, similar function that you can get for your phone uh, available from the App Store or, for, or from uh, Google Play. So you can go right to uh, either of those uh, access points and get the Ecological Marine Unit app. You have to search for Ecological Marine Unit uh, and download that free. We also have written all of this up as a, a paper that was published in uh, Oceanography. And one of the things that we uh, asked in that paper is do these depth findings, so for instance we have the, this zonation uh, in the ocean that was data driven from the World Ocean Atlas layers, does that make sense? Uh, especially according to the typical divisions of the marine environment that we teach in our introductory oceanography classes. And we found uh, in this particular uh, paper 
which summarizes this work, and the, these, this is all of the, uh, the gory details here. I'll, I'll give you the reference uh, for this paper at the end of the webinar. But we found uh, that things do make, make sense in terms of uh, horizontal distributions, which you're looking at on the left, and vertical distributions uh, on the right. So uh, horizontally, uh, the, the 37 mutually exclusive ecological marine unit clusters do represent some maximum global horizontal uh, dimensions at selected depths. So you'll be able to look at this slide a little later because I'll share these with you, but this is showing what the clustering uh, is at the surface in the upper left and then sequentially down in the water column at 200, 400, 800, 1200, 1800, 2400, and at 3800 3, meters uh, in the water column. On the right, you're looking at a vertical profile area graph with depth that's on the y-axis and the uh, area of the oceans uh, in terms of millions of square kilometers in the on the x-axis in terms of those clusters. And we can see, uh, it, it's very interesting to see the variety at the top of the water column and then down through the water column we can see how clusters either slowly disappear with depth or in some cases deep water clusters become more important. Uh, it's, uh, it's very interesting uh, in terms of how these interleave in a vertical sense. We don't see uh, a parallel, uh, a horizontal demarcation uh, at these depth zones, the way that we depict that in our diagrams for our textbooks and so forth. But this is really neat to see this because it's driven uh, by the data. There are ways to try to visualize this uh, in 3D as well. We do have all of these data in 3D. Uh, these are basically 3D map packages in ArcGIS Pro. But uh, let me just uh, show you how we do uh, depict this. So we're going to fly into the Hawaiian Islands here and what you're looking at basically is uh, the ocean uh, base map uh, for context. We're going to turn everything uh, horizontally so that we can uh, zoom through and you see these cylinders popping up that represent uh, the World Ocean Atlas data as uh, in these particular clusters, but instead of depicting this as a continuous grid of data, which it is, we're representing these units as columns so that you can see sideways uh, into the layers uh, at depth. So these columns are basically the centroids uh, of the quarter by quarter degree cells. It's also interesting to think about how uh, nutrient and oxygen distributions uh, not only shape, but are shaped by biological processes. And the red disks that you see are the EMUs, uh, the locations where there's actually hypoxia. Uh, we have global coverage, but the video just ends up showing you the hypoxic uh, regions in the, in the Pacific. Uh, I should also mention that these uh, ecological marine units, in terms of time, they are 50 to 60 year averages. So it's a 50 to 60 year snapshot uh, in terms of, in this case, dissolved oxygen that you're looking at here, a different way to visualize dissolved oxygen. These columns are here again, but these columns represent dissolved oxygen, so they're a little fatter uh, and thicker at the surface. And then these columns, of course, uh, taper down into the water column all the way down to the bottom. This is off of Tasmania uh, so that you can uh, visualize dissolved oxygen in a new way. We've also added uh, the global uh, currents data of Bernard Barnier uh, and, and colleagues. Uh, this is from work that was published in Ocean Dynamics in 2006, but persists now as a global quarter by quarter degree uh, data set of the world's ocean current uh, strength and direction. So we have those uh, current vectors uh, depicted uh, in a similar manner. We have a, a resource a website where you can find out all about this particular project and we have a simple guide to help you uh, build your own mesh 
attach your own data set, perform various kinds of analyses, visualize and share your results. Because one of the things that we want the community to feel free to do is to focus on your own area of interest where you have higher resolution data, higher resolution spatially and temporally. And so now that we are uh, certain that our clustering algorithm uh, works well, we uh, share our clustering algorithm with you so that you can build your own mesh and your own finer scale ecological marine units. We have some guides to help you in terms of a GIS sense where you can use uh, GIS functions to measure size, shape, and distribution, find the uh, best locations, particularly for marine protected area design, detect and quantify patterns, and so forth. So uh, this comes from uh, the major uh, website, the web presence for this project. We also have a discussion group so that you can ask us questions along these lines. Uh, you can contribute uh, or express your desire to contribute uh, data. Uh, we are giving, we've been giving various talks about this project at meetings such as most recently the European Geosciences Union. So all of that is available on this GeoNet discussion group that's focused on the ecological marine units. As I mentioned, this is only the beginning of a long-term project, and we're working on adding additional data right now, primarily the Ocean Biogeographic Information System, or OBIS, uh, data so that we do have species abundance and distribution data, more ocean color. Uh, we are working on finer tuning of the temporality of the World Ocean Atlas data that we use so that we can tease out the seasonal or monthly signal in that data so that we're not just dealing with a 50 to 60 year average. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, uh, we welcome you to uh, work with us in terms of your own study area with high resolution data. We're working on uh, more and better tools, particularly our 3D web viewer and a 3D cross section or fence diagram tool and some analysis tools, uh, particularly in terms of 3D uh, interpolation or 3D geo-enrichment. Geo-enrichment just meaning that we can add, uh, we can enrich the current data with additional data that can be added in as attributes. So I think I'm just about out of time here so that we have some time for, for questions. But uh, this slide, gives you all the goodies in terms of the top address is the main website for the project. Uh, the second address is the most direct access to the actual data that you can download either for the ArcGIS framework or you can download it for other GIS or other software packages. Uh, we even have an OGC uh, geo packages a version of the entire uh, 52 million points uh, that we can we can share. The third address is the discussion group that I mentioned, where you can uh, interact with our our team. There's also a, a technical report that was just published under the auspices of the AAG, the Association, uh, the American Association of Geographers which provides the technical details of the data compilation. Uh, but the, the fifth uh, line in that orange box is uh, the actual peer-reviewed journal article that was just published in Oceanography. And so that's the reference uh, if you want to also go to that paper. And we uh, were also featured in uh, Nature at the beginning of the year so that that also helped to, to pique uh, people's interest in this project. Uh, you can also get a hold of me at the email address that you see there or on Twitter. And I'm uh, very proud to show the logos of the various collaborators who made this project possible and also uh, very exciting and fun. So that's, uh, Sarah asked me to keep it to about 30 minutes and so that's hopefully what I've done, and now I'm very pleased to, to welcome any questions or comments. 
Okay, great. Thank you so much, Don. Um, this is a great overview of a tremendous amount of work and an exciting future for the project, too. Um, so to give everyone a reminder to um, ask questions, um, type them into the question panel, the inter user interface, and I'll relay them to Don. Um, okay, so we have some questions already. Now, uh, we'll start, this was a question that came in quite early, so um, to some, some aspects you may have answered. Um, are these data inferred or predicted um, based on point in situ real data, and what is the maximum resolution? Yes, so they, the, the World Ocean Atlas is made up of uh, various types of data sources. Uh, most of them are in situ because of the Argo float network, uh, but there are also uh, the global uh, contributions of XBT data, glider data. Uh, there is There are some satellite uh, observations as well for the surface, but this is mainly based on the, uh, the worldwide system of Argo floats. And the data are at a quarter degree by quarter degree resolution, so that's about 27 kilometers square. Uh, at the equator. And one of the exciting things about this is that uh, as NOAA uh, updates this World Ocean Atlas, they're going to incorporate a deep Argo so that there are many, many more observations uh, that are made uh, for the, the deeper part of the water column. The data set is rich in the upper 250 to 1,000 meters uh, of the water column and consistent with, again, the, the uh, the observations that are available, but hopefully that will, will get better uh, as we have access to uh, more uh, deeper uh, observations or observations that are made in the, the lower parts of the water column. Uh, I hope that, that answers uh, the question. Okay, yeah, I think it does, and if it doesn't, uh, uh, CC will let me know. Okay, let's see. Uh, how did you decide on a 50-year average for the uh, ecological marine units calculated? Um, was a sensitivity analysis of time frame length conducted? So uh, again, we, we basically uh, deferred to the World Ocean Atlas. Uh, and so the World Ocean Atlas, uh, one point uh, in the mesh that we derived from the atlas is essentially an average uh, of the five or six uh, decades over which the World Ocean Atlas uh, has observations. So it's essentially an average of an average of the prominent mean uh, in temperature, salinity, dissolved oxygen, nitrate, silicate, and phosphate uh, over, over 50 years. Okay, all right. Um, good, let's see. I'm a teacher. What would be the best way to use the data available in the classroom? Uh, is the downloadable app necessary? So for, for teachers, we actually recommend that you use uh, the, the web app. Uh, and with the web app, you don't have to download anything. You just point your, your browser to the address that was on that particular slide, which is, um, maybe I can just, oh no, I, if I try to get out of PowerPoint, it wants me to leave the webinar, so I don't want to do that. Oh, okay. <laughs> so basically, it's that livingatlas.arcgis.com slash emu. So you just have your students open up a web browser, put in that address, and then you are on your way. You can, uh, you can actually uh, explore to your heart's content. And that's one of the best ways for, for teachers uh, to use this, because even if you're not concerned with ecological marine unit classifications, you're basically able to query millions and millions of points and just see what the change in temperature or salinity or nutrients or oxygen is at that point location from the surface all the way down to to near the ocean floor and that's very it's, it's wonderful for self-exploration it's wonderful for explaining to your students uh, why there are changes uh, in these profiles what for instance why there is a thermocline uh, why uh, dissolved oxygen uh, changes uh, as opposed to it's often the exact opposite of nutrients because of what the, the critters are doing in the water column, et cetera. Now, we do have a couple of collaborators who are interested in creating educational modules uh, based on the ecological marine units. 
uh, this is particularly at the University of South Florida. Uh, and so we hope that in the future we'll be able to release uh, some resources or maybe a small curriculum that you can use in your classroom uh, so that you can go beyond uh, the self-exploration uh, that's available with with the web app or with the mobile app. Okay, well that's that will be exciting when it when it comes to fruition. Okay, thank you, Don. Um, we have a, a bunch of good questions. Let's see. Are there plans to add a data layer for pH? Yes, yes, there there is. Uh, we've been working with uh, the Pacific Marine Environmental Laboratory along those lines. Uh, pH, as we know, is very, very difficult to measure in the ocean uh, on a global, you know, a global pH uh, layer. But we do have plans to to capture as much of that as we can and add that eventually as as a layer. Uh, basically, our modus operandi is we we already have the physical structure with the six primary parameters, and then so other things such as uh, pH or particulate organic concentration, these things can be uh, added as attributes uh, to those 37 clusters. The other approach also is that if you are working in a particular area of the ocean, you have, uh, you're doing ocean acidification studies and you've got uh, high resolution uh, data uh, of ocean pH, you can uh, cluster your your part of the ocean uh, for pH, uh, hopefully using our algorithm to help. And then you've got your ecological marine unit, your own ecological marine unit uh, that is, <clears throat> excuse me, that that focuses on that parameter. Okay. And, and in the meantime, I think you answered actually another question we had. Um, but I'm going to read out the question, but I think you pretty much answered it. When you talk about adding data, such as currents or data from OBIS, does that go into the cluster discriminant analysis with the potential for changing the size distribution of the EMUs, or are those additional data sets mainly integrated to provide context for existing EMU definitions? So it's the latter. It's to provide the context. We don't want to have to uh, recluster for the entire global ocean every time we want to add uh, something, uh, add a new parameter. So so our approach is we went with the, the standard uh, six parameters, clustered the ocean based on those six, and then uh, additional information like the, the OBIS, uh, those are attributes uh, that we're going to integrate uh, into the, the clusters or attach to the clusters. Okay, thank you, Don. Um, thank and this this comment question. Um, thank you for the talk. It was very informative. Is there a way that the three D data set can be incorporated into ArcMap as a layer for two D observations with other data sets? Yes. So uh, these are the, the data. When you go to the esriurl.com slash emu data, you will see uh, a whole list of choices. And uh, most of the choices you can look at either in 2D in ArcMap or in 3D in ArcGIS Pro. So we basically provide uh, these as 2D layers or as 3D map packages. I would actually encourage you to uh, fool around with this in Pro and to do as much as you can uh, in ArcGIS Pro because um, as an aside, the capabilities that we're building uh, into ArcGIS, uh, the best capabilities in terms of spatial analysis are actually being built into ArcGIS Pro. And then uh, they are being uh, back filled into uh, ArcMap so that ArcMap can keep up, uh, to, be, to be frank. <laughs> So the, the best and the, the, the tip of the spear is ArcGIS Pro, and uh, ArcGIS Pro is being uh, further designed and developed to be easier to use, and it's really, it's really the future in terms of the desktop portion of the ArcGIS platform. So that's my, my Wednesday tip for you. Okay, well, we're very glad to get the insider's tips. All right. 
Good. Um, another question. Have you interfaced with the Nature Conservancy's Ocean Wealth Index efforts? Yes, we have. Uh, happily, we have. And we're actually going uh, up to see uh, Zach for Dania and company uh, at a, a, a nice little workshop. Uh, I think that's going to be held at Microsoft uh, headquarters because there's some nice convergence going on between Esri and Microsoft and uh, the Nature Conservancy in terms of virtual science data machines and so forth. That That's an aside. But at any rate, yes, we've been working with uh, the Ocean Wealth Group. They, they use our 2D uh, ocean base map and they're very interested in incorporating uh, the, the 3D uh, ecological marine units. So, so in a word, yes. Okay, great. That's great to hear. Um, how often do you anticipate updating the EMU data sets? Will it be on the same update cycle as the World Ocean Atlas? Yes, because this we, we basically based all of this on the World Ocean Atlas. Uh, we we uh, acknowledge and recognize and respect NOAA for their, their leadership uh, in this. And so as they move forward with updating uh, the World Ocean Atlas, then we will uh, make the effort to do a complete uh, reclustering at some point uh, to match their their latest version. Okay, great. Um, let's see. And is the raw data available with the graphs? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not quite understanding uh, with, yeah. with the graphs. Yeah, and it might have been, uh, this question came about the time that uh, we were talking about the educational materials. But if it's... Well, uh, Perhaps uh, well, let's just talk about raw data availability. Uh, yeah, the yeah the the, the raw data uh, are are available. Uh, in fact, I'm wondering if I can. The arrows won't let you go forward or backward. Oh, won't let me go forward. Anyway, we we have the uh, you can you can get the data in various forms. You can get all of the 52 million points if you want. Uh, you can get all of the uh, the clusters, the 37 clusters, the clustering of those 52 million points in 2D or 3D. Uh, you can uh, get various uh, uh, views uh, that we have already uh, pre-cooked uh, in, in ArcMap for you. Uh, we can work with you to do a subset. We do have some regional subsets of the data that we prepared for certain conferences. So, so for instance, we have the Western Pacific uh, in terms of of the uh, the clusters and, and the points. So it's not the entire world, but we did that for uh, the ACES Oceania uh, meeting uh, earlier in the year. Uh, so, so, so there there are various there are variations on this. We also have uh, PowerPoint slide decks. Uh, we do have uh, graphs. Uh, the the actual figures that are from the oceanography paper, or the uh, the uh, AAG uh, technical report. Uh, those are available. So so yes, we can. We have all of these things that are that are available now, or we can we can work with you uh, to help you. Uh, access uh, resources in the way that you would that you would like that would be uh, helpful to you. Okay. All right. Thank you, Don. Um, can you tell us um, a little bit more about any other proposed uses that may not have come up uh, during the questions or the presentation to date? So we have some of these. We have what are called uh, some use cases, and. Uh, so, for instance, there is uh, some work that's being proposed by the Marine Biodiversity Observation Network uh, to, to use the ecological marine units uh, to look at uh, seascape uh, structure up in using the Arctic as a, as a case, as a use case, uh, so that we can understand what the, uh, what the biodiversity uh, outlook uh, will be for, for that particular part of the ocean, and also to tie in with the Marine Biodiversity Observation Network's plans for a pole-to-pole, -pole, so Arctic to Antarctic uh, characterization of ocean diversity. Uh, there is uh, a project that uh, a collaborator 
Uh, she was at PMEL, uh, but she's moving to the Southern California Coastal Watershed Research Project, and she is interested in doing uh, the the uh, carbonate uh, ocean acidification uh, study with ecological marine units, and indeed in ta attaching uh, some ocean acidification uh, parameters uh, to the ecological marine units, helping us uh, to do that. I think she's going to focus mainly on uh, the the Eastern Pacific Ocean, but we hope to use that approach and extend that globally if we can. Uh, there are some more practical uh, marine spatial planning uh, projects that are planned. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Sylvia Earle's Mission Blue Hope Spots uh, effort wants to, to use uh, the ecological marine units as a backdrop so that when people are proposing new hope spots, they can actually swim through the EMUs uh, to help them understand the broader context. Uh, there, we, we have a list of about uh, 10 uh, case studies, and so uh, there, there are several that are uh, escaping me right now without my notes. Uh, also, the Gulf of Mexico Restoration uh, Group is interested in using uh, the ecological marine units as a backdrop uh, as they assess uh, restoration in the Gulf. Is the ecological marine units, you can also think of it as a 3D base map. So just having that uh, 3D base map as a context for, for many of these studies uh, is, is really, we hope, will be very valuable. Okay, great. Thank you, Don. Um, to follow up on that, uh, do you recall any, uh, or well, here's the question that was asked. Are there active projects using the EMUs to value ecosystem services? And, or any like proposed use cases would be good too. Yeah, interestingly enough, we've not had a specific uh, use case on valuing ecosystem services yet, and so we would very much welcome that because that is one of the original uh, asks of, of GEO. Uh, they, they want these ecological land, ocean, freshwater uh, determinations so that people can uh, embark on these uh, regional ecosystem uh, assessment studies. And one thing about ecosystem services assessment is that I think it's for it certainly it's it's valuable anywhere, but people may be thinking of this more in terms of uh, coastal studies. And one thing that the ecological marine units is not as good at right now is uh, coastal studies because the coarseness uh, of our framework, uh, it, it's not good for that. A quarter by quarter degree, 27 kilometer resolution is not going to help you with estuaries or with um, uh, the EEZ. So this is why we're doing uh, the ecological coastal unit project so that we can have uh, a global uh, shoreline uh, delineation uh, classification and near shore classification at a much a finer resolution that will help stitch the ecological marine units to the ecological land units. Now, we we don't have many details on the ecological coastal units project yet. We're having a a side meeting to to plan that effort at the upcoming Esri Ocean GIS forum, which is uh, that meeting will probably take place May 31st uh, in Redlands. Uh, at Esri headquarters. Uh, Roger Sayer and some colleagues have been working on uh, digitizing a, uh, a rigorous uh, global shoreline according to various vertical datums. It's an effort that is really, uh, really tremendously difficult, but he's, he's working right now from uh, Landsat imagery to, to do that. But if you're interested in that, uh, please send me an email and uh, we'd love to get you uh, involved in that effort. But I think that's going, the ecosystem services valuation part of this will become, pe people will be able to see uh, how that might be better possible if we have uh, the finer resolution uh, available in the, the coastal regions. Okay. All right. Well, that's an exciting. I wasn't aware of that initiative, Don. so that's great to know about. Um, then uh, back to a more technical question. Um, 
what format, so if you have, if you have high resolution data, like what format uh, does it need to be in to be integrated into the EMU? Uh, if you've got uh, any XYZ, so if, you, if you've got, the, this is basically how we were able to uh, work with the World Ocean Atlas data, you know, the World Ocean Atlas data, uh, we, we took the X, Y, and Z uh, measurements, uh, the 52 million points, and uh, integrated uh, everything into this uh, point mesh framework. So if you have uh, X, Y, Z, if you have uh, net CDF, uh, we can work readily with net CDF. Uh, we, we can work pretty much with, um, with most, most formats. Okay. Okay. Um, we have a couple other questions sort of addressing some really specific things. Um, there were some questions regarding the, the reclustering. Um, are there any other um, sort of essential elements that uh, if, if uh, XYZ, global XYZ data became available that would warrant reclustering of the EMUs? Or is it where it's pretty solid at the six? Uh, it's pretty solid at going now. Okay. Yes, it's pretty solid. So to put this in context, to, to get these clusters was about two weeks of continuous computing time. We did not use uh, a supercomputer. Uh, we did, uh, I think we did use some of our Amazon Web Services uh, credits for that, but it was very heavy computationally. We can certainly improve on that. Uh, but in terms of a global uh, clusters, the 37 global clusters, we'd, we'd like to prevent, uh, we, we took this approach so that we didn't have to, every time there was a new, uh, a new addition, to redo all of that computation. So it's, it's, it's pretty set, and we, uh, we were raked through the coals on peer review and revising, and we have that uh, assessment from our peer reviewers that our approach is pretty sound. Uh, focusing on those six parameters that provide the physical system that the ecosystem uh, is going to respond to. Now, if you're talking about a smaller region, like say for the Gulf of Mexico or the Southern California Bight, and you've got your higher resolution data, th this is where we most certainly uh, would recommend that you recluster uh, for that smaller area, it's going to be it's going to make sense uh, computationally. It will be uh, it will be better than our ecological marine units, which is a global data set. You will have uh, clustered for your smaller uh, area with finer scale data, and we are very eager to see uh, the research community uh, try that and to kind of set the um, Take, take the reins, so to speak, because one thing about this project is that we, uh, we do not want to be the sole arbiters of ecological marine units. We kind of got the ball rolling uh, as commissioned by GEO. Uh, we worked out this approach, but we want to give this approach away so that others can, can take it and extend it. And, and this is particularly for, for smaller parts uh, of the ocean. Okay, that was that was going to be the next question, so I'm glad you went there with it. Thank you, Don. Um, Nick, if uh, if you're able, would you be able to put the um, link to the recording up in the chat for folks? We've had a couple of uh, requests for uh, how people could access the recording of the webinar. Um, so either that, and, and if if not, just email. Uh, yeah, okay, Nick's put it up, and if everybody looks in the chat, you can get the link for where uh, the recording will be housed in just about an hour or so. Okay, uh, one last question right now, um, and we'll see if any others come in. We've just got a few more minutes anyway. Um, is it, what is the relationship uh, with this project and ICANN, the International Coastal Atlas Network? Oh, ICANN is a, is a separate initiative that is, uh, again, mainly focused on coastal regions, and ICANN is a, a community. As a co-founder of ICANN, I can describe it uh, in my own words as a community of 
uh, organizations, local, state, federal governments who are building uh, their own coastal web atlases, uh, their own portals uh, to facilitate marine spatial planning. So uh, ICANN is a community uh, that's focused on activities, uh, focused on uh, technology, whereas the Ecological Marine Units is basically a data set. Uh, it's a it's a data framework that any of the members in ICANN can incorporate or any any community can incorporate the Ecological Marine Unit's uh, data set. You can draw that in as a base map uh, to your coastal web atlases. Uh, if you have a, uh, a small uh, project, uh, particularly as our Ecological Marine Unit's uh, effort turns to uh, ecological coastal units and producing that global data set, uh, we would certainly love for, for ICANN uh, folks to be involved. But uh, as it stands right now, we, we hope that we uh, provide a useful input uh, to what the ICANN folks are building. There's also uh, another connection because we are incorporating uh, OBIS data and both OBIS and ICANN are projects underneath the UNESCO International Oceanographic Data Exchange, or uh, the UNESCO IODE. So, so there is that, that linkage as well. Okay. Well, that's it for the questions. Uh, Don, this was great. We're so glad to give this update on the EMUs and learn about uh, all the exciting work going on. We really appreciate you being here to talk to us today. And for everyone who was able to attend, thank you so much. Um, if you, uh, the link to the, the recording is there, please feel free to share with any colleagues who might also be interested. And we hope you can join us in the future for future webinars. But uh, I'll just wrap up by saying thank you again, Don. Oh, thank you. It's a great honor to be able to present to your network. Uh, the EBM Tools Network is still one of the best networks around in so many, so many ways. So it's a real pleasure to be, to be able to contribute. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Don. Okay, and bye, everyone. Have a great rest of your day.